Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of The Journey. Today, we got a special guest on. I don't know if he's ever done a podcast before. Hopefully, this is, might be his first one, but who knows? And uh, we got Andy Buchanan here. How's it going, Andy? How are you doing, Mackenzie? I am very well as I look, I'm sure. Yeah, you look great. You look like you've been <laughs> in Nashville for a few days. <laughs> yeah, thank you, buddy. You're far too kind. Um, yeah, not feeling too great. Obviously, Nashville's been a bit tough on the old uh, liver, all the bars and all that. But yeah, good to see all the friends and clients and yeah, good time in Nashville. Yeah, I bet. I bet you've had a lot of fun. So that's awesome. Um, so dude, let's dive right in. Let's, who are you? What, like, you know, let's kind of start kind of who you are and how did you get started into the outdoor filming industry? So Mackenzie, much like yourself, I grew up uh, with a father who enjoyed hunting. So at a very early age, we... As kids would go on hunting trips, you know, when everyone else was going on vacation to, you know, the beach or whatever, we would go to the bush. You know, dad would pack up all the trucks full of tents and all the guns and the, the Land Rovers and everything. And would all head off in convoy into the Zambezi Valley and go hunting and fishing for a month. So, you know, that kind of upbringing, you know, at, at three, four years old, um, kind of leaves very little um, in the imagination of adventure, you know. So... Once you, once you got into that, it was hooked. Um, and then, yeah, that pretty much started it off. And, you know, all I wanted to do for the rest of my life was just be in the bush. You know, school was kind of out the window. I did enjoy sports, but uh, nothing came close to the bush. So, yeah, that just kind of made it my, 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 my way to make a living. I didn't realize you can make a living through being in the bush, but you actually can. <laughs> Perfect. So you were born and raised in Zim, right? Yeah, I was born and raised in Zimbabwe. We, uh, we had a farm, um, and yeah, obviously on the farm there was a lot of animals as well. You know, it depends, you know, how deep you looked in the bush and in the, in the granite copies in the hills, you'd always find um, different animals and snakes and birds. And um, so, yeah, we, we grew up in Zimbabwe and it was very fortunate and privileged upbringing, but uh, that's where the you know, the daily bush excursions we had was on the farm. Oh, that's awesome, man. So, um, obviously, like, you started hunting when you were little. When did you, like, so obviously, you, when did you start actually hunting? What was your first actual game animal? So, when I was really little, my, I remember my dad bought us uh, air rifles, and it was, it was, I think it was Christmas, if I remember correctly, and then, We'd opened all our presents and we thought Christmas was over. And then he said, we've got one more present. Go and look under your beds, you know. So we scooted off to the bedroom and there, my brother's two years older than me, but under our beds was these uh, beautiful air rifles. They even had a scope on them, you know. And in that time, a scope on an air rifle was like the real McCoy, you know. (laughs) (laughs) I think the scopes were broken in about two days, but... um, the air rifles lived on. So, yeah, we would, my brother and I would wake up every morning and said so it was competition time. You know, you go that way, I'll go this way. And then we had a point system with little birds. Um, but we were young. I mean, we were like three, four years old. You know, we were tiny. I remember, you couldn't actually put the gun onto your shoulder. You'd put it under your arm, you know, and sort of have a look. And, uh, yeah, yeah, and my dad, my dad was, well, he was pretty cool. He would give us like a, a ration of bullets. So... We would get like five pellets, and if we came back with five birds, we'd would 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 be you know would be upgraded to six pellets for the next day. So nice. we got quite clever. We would shoot with our slingshots. You know, if we ran out of pellets, we'd shoot a bird with our slingshot, and then we'd come back to him and show him. You know, this is our five birds because we always wanted more pellets. But uh, he was a bit wiser than that, and he and he realized that the birds actually didn't have a hole in them. You know, they'd just been bashed mm. by a stone. So. Um, often we were, we were caught out. So yeah, we had to be careful how we tried to navigate our extra bullets. Oh, that's awesome, man. So that's super cool. And then obviously you probably graduated a big game. When was your first big game hunt? So a big game, I mean, my first like big animal. So without, we used to get some pretty big animals with our, with our air guns, but, um, Anyway, the next thing was obviously the 22, and then, you know, with that, we'd yeah. start shooting dikers and impala and stuff like that. Oh, cool. Um, but, so unfortunately, by the, when I was six years old, my father actually passed away. So 
our life of hunting and going on bush excursions and whatever was kind of plucked from us at that at that age and I mean we still we went and lived on another farm and we'd still I mean we'd go out at night with the air guns and I mean with our dogs as well and we'd go and um my poor mother, we would force her to drive the vehicle until we found it, like a dike or whatever, and then we'd release the dogs and, <laughs> and chase after the... I mean, we were like proper little poachers, you know. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, I mean, the hunting never stopped, but we just didn't get to go on as many trips. And then we used to go with family friends, you know, my dad's friends. We used to go to um, on the hunting trips and all that. And then, yeah, but... Like I said, you know, it wasn't quite the same as when we were with Dad. We were with Dad. We were privileged, and then now we had to sort of make a plan to, to get into the bush and all that. Um, so after school, was when you know obviously we had to finish school. That was part of the deal. Uh, but after we finished school, our mum was like, "You can do whatever you want." So as soon as I finished school, I went straight to Tanzania, um, found a job there with um, an outfitter. Um, and yeah, then from then I just knew when I finished school that I just wanted to be back in the bush. And then I started doing my professional hunter's license in Tanzania. And then there was a, a few, uh, there was a bit of a hiccup there after two years, the boss I was working for at the time, he didn't have me a work permit. So I'd come in on a one month visa and I'd been there for two years and I got caught riding my motorbike without a helmet as you are at 18, 19 years old, you know, brave heart himself and then th that's when I found I didn't have a work permit so I had to run away from there and then I went to Mozambique uh, and started hunting there and then I decided you know what I want to go back to Zimbabwe and then when I went back to Zim although I'd been doing four years of apprenticeship there was the, Zimbabwe is very strict in their rules and that nothing you do outside of Zimbabwe counts so I was like okay well I have to do another four years and you know Taking into consideration, I've, I'd been earning $300 a month for the past four years at basically just eating like what the locals eat and not, being, not having my own room, whatever, sleeping in a tent. Like it was really rough. I said, well, I've got I to gotta find a way to make a bit more money, you know. And that's when, that's when I, um, I discovered that you can actually film hunts. So I thought, well, let, me, let me bridge the gap here and do my apprenticeship. Um, whilst I film hunts so I can earn a little bit of money and then it turned out that I was pretty good at filming hunts so then that started getting going and then the sort of the pH thing sort of fell behind a little bit um, and that's yeah there's just snowballed from there Mackenzie it was I didn't really plan anything but it's all turned out all right I think yeah sweet so what year would that have been that you started like transitioning from pH to filming like how, how long ago was that that was that was in 2011 was so in 2010 um a lady in mozambique came with a camera and her husband was hunting and she was filming and i was watching her and i was like well that looks pretty cool so then i asked her can i hold the camera for a day you know and she was more than happy and then um she reviewed the footage and she was like dude you're really good at this um so when i moved back to zim and they said start again you know your apprenticeship um, that's when I came to think, hey, that lady said I was pretty good at filming, so let me get a camera and try and do the whole filming thing. Uh, so, yeah, it was to, about 2011 when I started filming. Oh, that's awesome, dude. So that's so you've been doing, you, since the start of it, you've been doing it 14, 15, you know, right in there, 14 years. So that's super sweet that you started that. And then, obviously, it went from, you know, now it's just straight up full-time. All you do is film. Um, so... You know, how has that been? You know, I know you've changed some stuff and moved, you know, around a little bit during the last few years, obviously, because doing your own thing and having a business is tough. And so, you know, uh, how how has that been for you, the, the transition period that you've been going through? Yeah, it's been it's been interesting. I mean, it's been it's been uh, there's been a lot of challenges. I tell you what, like like. Obviously, doing a TV show, your most important thing is keeping your sponsors happy. But at the same time, I don't want to be the TV show that is just like, you know, this is my gun and this is my certain bullet. And this is, of course, there's a, there's a certain amount of that you have to do to keep your sponsors happy. But I remember watching shows when I was growing up 
and being like, this is just a giant infomercial, really. Mm -hmm. So I've been lucky with my sponsors. They've given me a real free reign. Um, so the TV show, I mean, I love the TV show. I mean, and and there's, so, there's so many, you know, being from Africa, there's so many different directions I can go with the show. And, and thankfully, my sponsors have all kind of given me that, you know, that creative freedom um, to go in the direction I feel is best. Um, obviously, we always try and keep it fun. I think the, the, one of the more difficult sides has been the booking of safaris. <clears throat> um, it, you, I'm trying to keep it to a minimal, you know what I mean? So I'll book a couple of hunts that I'm going to film and buddies of mine and all that that love to be with me <clears throat> on safari. Um, but yeah, the booking side, you got to be careful because if you get too big too quick, you, you, you start losing the the ability to give that, um, you know, that, 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 what do you call it? That the experience that everybody wants. Yeah. Yeah. So, cause your TV show, you've had it on the sportsman's channel, correct? Yeah. It started on the, on the pursuit channel. And then I moved, uh, to the sportsman's channel just because I think the audience on the sportsman's channel is more an audience that would be likely to, um, to be a, you know, doing these premium safaris that we do. Yeah, fair enough. And so most of your, I mean, obviously you go wherever, but like living in Zim, you have a great opportunity because there's a lot of great hunting in Zimbabwe. So like it's mainly a primarily home-based focus on Zim safaris. And then if clients want to go elsewhere, do you go elsewhere with them? Or how do you work that kind of around? Yeah, so, I mean, obviously living in Zimbabwe, it's much easier for me to, to do a hunt in Zim because, you know, I don't have to take any flights anywhere. I don't have to um, be away from home longer than I need to be. Um, so, yeah, home is, a, I mean, Zimbabwe is a, a, a place that I like to hunt. And also Zim is, is quite nice because it bridges the price gap. Like, obviously, mm. South Africa and Namibia got some of the cheaper hunts. Well, you know, some places in Namibia. Um, but then Zim is sort of that next price up. So before you start going, you know, and then in, and then Zambia is a little bit more expensive. Mozambique's a little more expensive. Tanzania, Botswana, those places now start getting, you know, really expensive. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, the I think Zim is is that that happy medium. Um, so I like to play in that in that zone. Um, but obviously, once guys have done Zim three or four times, they start now wanting to sniff around in other spots. So um, that's when I do also help them in the right direction there. Yeah, that's cool. So, like, I know you've been a lot of places. Let's kind of dive into, like, all the different places you've been filming. Obviously, Zim, you know, where else have you been filming? And, uh, you know, kind of just kind of break it down, all the places you've been, and then let's talk about your favorite one besides Zim that you've been to? Uh, so, yeah, so obviously I've, if we start south and work north, I've, I've filmed in um, South Africa, Namibia, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, uh, Tanzania, Uganda, Cameroon, Ethiopia, Botswana. No, I missed that one. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I haven't been to the Congo yet. So I'm still thirsting to go there. Um, I think we spoke about it a while ago. I think you were going, yeah. and I was a bit jealous there. But um, I wanted to come with. But uh, yeah, um, so in terms of Africa, that's 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 pretty much it. And then uh, I've been fortunate to be go to. Uh, I went to Alaska, which was pretty cool. Uh, did a bear hunt there with a client that wanted me to come and film, and then did Tajikistan with another Mr. Wayne, which was horrifying i mean those those steep mountains i'll leave that to you buddy <laughs> yeah. yeah so, so no, i've been around but uh, you know talking of that the, one of the, the places i really enjoyed i think the most was the cameroon cameroon rainforest i know you've mm. done a couple of those hunts and uh so cool i mean you know um just for us creatives you know like taking photos of the bugs and the butterflies and and all the insects in the forest and the trees and the leaves um you know just uh, parrots flying around gorillas running around uh just wild man just like i don't know very cool i like the rainforest yeah i hate it when i was there 
at day like nine or ten but after that after that like now i'd go back you know because it was fun like you said there's so much stuff to take photos of the bugs the butterflies there's so many different butterflies yeah. it's just a very <laughs> unique experience um yeah. luckily as the cameraman i wasn't too concerned about obviously you want to shoot your bonga you know what i mean but i was just yeah. like <laughs> running around capturing all the small critters yeah yeah that's sweet yeah. um you know, so and then so you do your TV show and then you have a YouTube channel and you upload past episodes onto the YouTube channel, correct? Yes, yeah. So obviously the episodes um, need to air on TV first um, as per your contract. Um, but I have managed to snivel away uh, to air a little bit here and there beforehand. Um, get, I got out of that contract bind a little bit, which was, which was quite cool. Um, so yeah, YouTube is another another big base of mine where I've got a lot of subscribers there. So um, and they <laughs> they keep me on my toes. You know, they're always harassing me about something. Why haven't you posted before? Or why aren't you posting often enough? Or I've seen this before. Or but you know, in general, they're 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 a good bunch of folks. They all uh, support me, and uh, it's a pretty cool deal. I love YouTube. <clears throat> yeah, I just. I just hope YouTube uh, lives forever. You know, sometimes yeah. you you worry about these platforms maybe going one way or the other and deleting your blooming channel that you've spent a lot of hard work on. So, yeah, but I mean, so far they've been good to me. So let's uh, pray to the YouTube gods that they continue. <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome. Do you have um, do you have like a schedule of anything that you're putting up on YouTube coming up soon? Or do you have any, like, how's your schedule look like for TV shows? Like, how's that look for you so far of upcoming stuff? Yeah, no, it's good. I mean, it's still airing on the Sportsman's channel. So I think we're on, we're on like episode six or seven of the 13 uh, new episodes for the season. Um, so yeah, we put out, the last one we put on YouTube was a crocodile hunt in Namibia with the cover safaris and we shot a giant crocodile like 15 foot three inches the biggest croc i've ever been on so that was a that was a pretty sweet episode um and then we've got yeah lots more coming as well so i've also started getting into this um problem animal control uh mm. films which is people are absolutely loving the the problem hyena control i think it's because it it dives into the the village folks and the you know the wildlife coming into conflict and and it's the biggest mm -hmm. one of the biggest problems we face in Africa at the moment is the humans moving on to wildlife land and then vice versa with the predators you know because they can the predators can just pop into the village and grab a goat and a this and a that rather than going hunting the the game that's harder to hunt um, so yeah it's very interesting and I love it I, I grew up a lot around the villages, um, on the farm and whatnot. So it's something I know a lot about. So it's very easy for me to portray that on the, on the, on the film. So yeah, it's something we're looking to do a little bit more of in the future as well. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. It's a good way of, you know, I like that kind of format to where you kind of show how it, Africa has, cause you guys, the population of Africa grows so much every year and it pushes yeah, you down don't the have if you don't have TV, your population will grow very fast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Proper entertainment there for sure. <laughs> yeah, um, for free. Yeah, free entertainment. Yeah, for sure. Exactly. Wow, that's a good way of putting it. But so, yeah, because I mean, you guys' population grows and everyone just expands so much that they get into the bush and they get they start encroaching on all the hunting areas, the parks, all that stuff, and the human and wildlife conflict has to be. A major issue especially in areas that are real remote you know where there's lions yeah. leopards hippos all that stuff um, yeah it is dude like i mean it's definitely one of the most um pressing um you know problems we have at the moment and what the, the funny thing how hunting plays into that is you know everyone says like why do you you know why should people hunt or how is hunting conservation and then you know you get people who don't really know who are like oh we need to control the population of animals or this and that and they're, they're they're completely wrong in my opinion the reason we need hunting is for the money the money is what keeps the wild places wild and there's very few but there's no businesses actually that bring in money constantly 
like a renewable source of income, uh, like hunting. You know, you're just taking off the top layer of old animals and the rest get to breed. And then the next year you can do exactly the same thing. So it's just completely renewable. So that's why Africa has kept these wild places is because the hunters pay so much money to come and do this, you know, the evil word, the trophy hunting. You know, that's the yeah. evil word is the trophy hunting. But the real, the real truth of the matter is it's financial hunting. That's what it should be called, financial gain. Because without that financial gain, the governments wouldn't keep those wild places wild. You know, they would mine it or they would farm it or they would, you know, do all these other activities in which wildlife has no place. So... Mm -hmm. You know, and that's you know that's the that's the one thing we still have to to. It's almost like bribing the local communities in Africa not to push further into the wilderness. Uh, you're bribing them with hunters' money because you say, well, if you move in there, you ain't gonna get this flipping you know whatever five hundred thousand dollars a year that that hunting is gonna bring for you. So. It's our one bargaining tool we have left. You know, we all know the photographic society cannot fill all these wild spaces. Um, you know, all we need is one client and he pays, you know, $120,000 for his one lion safari or whatever it is. And that sustains that enormous million acres of wilderness. Whereas to run it with the photographics, you're going to have to have how many camps and how many people. And anyway, most of the hunting areas are not suitable for photographics because they're just tough. And no one wants to go on a photographic safari to, to suffer, you know, as whereas hunters don't mind suffering, you know. Yeah. So, you know, that's the two, the two biggest uh, threats to wildlife in Africa at the moment is the human, wildlife, uh, human population growth and the, the anti-hunting movement. So, the, you know, and the anti-hunting movement will be a quicker kill than the human encroachment. So it actually, if you want it in order, it's the, it's the anti-hunting movement versus the, uh, it will be first and then the human wildlife is the two biggest threats we have in Africa. And it's funny that the, the biggest threat to Africa are people that think they are saving African game by stopping hunting. So, yeah, this is what it is. Kenya. but uh, Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Kenya, Kenya did the whole stop hunting thing and it just, you know, they struggle to admit it. But then the numbers of game um, in their country will show you exactly what happened. And, you know, their game just now, now Kenya faces the problem of humans on the borders of their national parks, whereas yeah. because of hunting in all the other African countries, they the national parks still have buffers around them between the humans and the national parks. You know, those buffers would be the hunting zones. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the proof is all there, but the problem is a lot of the anti-hunting folks don't want to listen because they think we are lying, you know? Yeah, no, for sure. And then also like, look at the whole thing that happened with all the elephants in Botswana when it shut down for a little bit. Like I was reading a book the other day. I was actually it's a bush buck book, but they were talking about how the elephants in the Chobe area in Botswana had completely annihilate all the trees and then it pretty much pushed out every of the small um, grazing species such as the bush buck and all that so there's like in the chobe area there's not a chobe bush buck left even though they're named after you know that area yeah. which is crazy no for sure for sure i mean there's a, there's a lot of misinformation out there I, I remember i bumped into a person on the plane um over here and they they just come off a safari in Botswana a photographic safari and they said what are you doing and I said no I'm going over to America for the hunting conventions and they're like oh what do you hunt you know I said well we hunt you know pretty much everything you know it's all government regulated but you know we do get a quota of you know lion elephant what and she, and he said you know the funny thing is I used to think elephants were endangered so I was like oh okay cool you know like a lot of the world um, he said, but I just came out of Botswana, and I tell you what, we saw thousands of elephants. He said, they were everywhere. He said, they were ripping all the trees down. And it was, and I said, well, yeah, it is the situation, but we're not allowed to control the population because, you know, of the uproar. You know, back in the day, we used to do culls and stuff. Um, it'd be nice to, you know, say, okay, let's just let the elephants grow in their populations or whatever. But like you say, now because of the human 
population growth, they don't have those corridors anymore that they used to have to move, you know, huge distances, the hundreds of miles elephants used to use. But now they can't do it anymore because there's people everywhere, um, villages and whatever. Um, so, yeah, now they're confined to their space and they're just getting a huge number in that space and we can't really control it. So, yeah, it's a bit of a ticking time bomb. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, same thing here in the States even too, like where I live. It's like you got elk and mule deer that have to migrate for the winter because of snow. But then a lot of the winter range has been populated by humans and like highways. So there's a lot of deer getting hit on the highway. So they had to build overpasses for them and underpasses. And so it's just a, it's a similar thing. Like it, even here in America, like the biggest people that think they're saving wildlife prior taking more wildlife off of the face of the planet every year because they, you know, are building city sky right you know they're building big cities everywhere you know leveling out land it's just funny like the people that think they're saving the most wildlife are actually not saving the wildlife at all so as we were talking we talked about how you know like kenya it has uh it's with their wildlife management it's pretty much went down the tubes you know other countries have been doing great and so i kind of want to transition and i want to ask you like how do people get a font filled by you because you know, there's a lot of different ways people usually do it, like social media, or whatever. But how does someone get a hunt filmed by you? So um, over time, it's just become when somebody asks me to book a hunt for them. So they come to me and say, listen, I really want to hunt in Botswana or uh, Zimbabwe or wherever it might be. Um, then I organize the hunt for them. And then more often than not, they want the filming done as well. That's uh so that's that's kind of how it works. I book the hunt for them, and then I do the filming, and then we air the episodes, and it's kind of like a rotating, the wheel that keeps going. Perfect. Um, so so here's my next set of questions: Is what kind of gear are you using, like for any younger? Because you see, there's a, quite a few people wanting to get into filming hunts and stuff. So what kind of gear are you using? So I use one of those, they call them run and gun cameras. Um, they, they got a zoom, a zoom rocker. So it's easy to zoom, you know, because you obviously you've got to be quick. You don't want to be delaying your client's uh, shot on the animal. So those run and gun cameras where it's got a fixed lens and then they got a zoom, you know, from like 35 mils to, I don't know, like 200 or something. That's the sort of the zoom. Um, and then, yeah, I just got some SD cards in there. Then always carry a photographic camera, taking some pictures along the way. And GoPros, um, GoPros are important. You can get some really cool stuff with the GoPros these days. And also some underwater shots, be a bit creative. And then drone, obviously the drone is very important as well. So all those kind of make up the, the, the camera gear. Cool. Now, when you first started, like, obviously, did you, this is stuff that you've learned over time, just to have like the GoPros and a different type of gear. When you first started, like, what camera did you have? That was my kind of a question I wanted to ask earlier, but what kind of camera did you when you first started? My first camera was a camera that had these little tapes, um, and it was terrible, because <laughs> yeah. you could actually hear on the audio this tape going around and around, Twee! so the whole time there was this humming sound in the audio of the footage. Um, I can't even remember where I got that camera. I think I, I probably bought it from a friend or something. Um, but yeah, it was crazy because you'd be in the middle of a stalk and you know the guys are putting up the shooting sticks or whatever and you have to now change your tape. Um, that was wild. And those, those tapes only did like an hour long or something. So no, we've come a long way. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we used to, the two cameras we started out with, I think one was a Panasonic or something. And it was those shitty little tapes and you'd have to, change them in and out and make sure that you had plenty of tape when it came time especially if you're sitting in a leopard blind or something you don't want to be fiddle fucking around with the the tape oh my god yeah no for uh, sure I, the leopard blinds actually or since you talk about it um i hear quite a few story of cameramen that get a bit nervous in the in the blind you know and hit the record button when the leopard jumps into the tree and then just before the client's about to shoot again they hit the record to hit it again to record and then they unrecord you know yeah. Uh, nice. yeah. 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 I could imagine. Oh, that'd be horrible. Just that yeah. excitement, double clicking it. So let's, okay. Since we're kind of on that subject, what has been, have you had any crazy like stories from safaris? I imagine you have something over the years, any Buffalo yeah. incidents? Uh, yeah. So my two, 
My two worst, well, my worst incidents was a leopard. Definitely, we we were okay. hunting and uh, shot this leopard, and it flicked out of the tree. Um, but old clever clogs was holding the 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 tripod arm when the shot went off. I wasn't expecting the shot to go off, so so my hand sort of jiggled the camera a little bit. So I couldn't see on my footage the impact shot. So we went down there, um, and the leopard basically was wounded. So we asked the client to stay behind. He was an elderly gentleman and um, just wasn't, the grass was long. And so then I got his rifle, we took the scope off, and then me and the PH went through the grass. And yeah, well, to cut a long story short, this leopard came from about 15 meters uphill through the long grass. And I dropped onto my knee, um, you know, to try and get to the same level as the leopard. Um, and the other PH was a little bit smarter. He took a few steps back to give himself a bit of room because where I was, was like long grass. But as I dropped onto my knee, all I could see was grass. But I could hear from the sound you know, that, <coughs> that it was coming straight towards me. Um, and I knew at some point, I have to pull the trigger at some point, but I couldn't see the leopard. So um, I ended up pulling the trigger when I just saw the grass breaking towards, towards me. I pulled the trigger and the leopard hit the end of the barrel and knocked me onto my back uh, and was on my lap chewing the end of the barrel. Thank goodness that bullet, um, that bullet uh, put him down. Um, so yeah, when people say, you know, why use an expensive bullet or, or whatever, you, that's why. I think, you know, I always wonder, you know, what happens if I wasn't using the bullet I was using? Um, yeah, but I mean, I don't know, there was angels there with me because I didn't, you know, I got back to camp and everyone was like, yeah, you're the hero, you know, whatever. But like, they said like, Where did, what did you shoot at? I said, I don't know what I shot at. I just pulled the trigger because I had to. Um, but yeah, I, there was actually burn marks on the leopard's hair from the muzzle blast. Um, that's how close it was. So yeah, that was, that was definitely the, the scariest of all scares. Was that in Zim? Yes, yeah, in the Makuti area, it was uh, long, long grass, and I mean the leopard just uh, had he had three legs, so one was flopping. Um, but I mean, that doesn't make much of a difference. I tell you what. No, no, definitely not. Wow, yeah, that's wild. Um, geez, that is wild. What's the coolest thing you've ever videoed? Have you videoed anything like, you know? Like a um, anything like a leopard killing something or a lion getting something or what's the coolest experience you've had? Like I've, I've actually been really unfortunate with that, you know. Um, I haven't really filmed anything cool. I mean, I think, you know, I, I often get like little insect shots sort of like a, you know, like a wasp and a spider attacking each other or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't had anything like a buffalo being taken down by lions or, you know, as much time as I've spent in the bush, you'd think I would have run into something. But... Uh, yeah, still, still waiting for my lucky day there. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I figured you would have had something, cra like, you know what I mean, just crazy. Yeah, um, have you ever had any incidents with elephants? Mm, I think elephants are probably the scariest creatures for me. Um, I remember last year I took a client and he was coming to Zimbabwe for the first time and we did a leopard and tuskless hunt. He dived straight into the deep end. And uh, we went, we got our leopard, a beautiful big leopard on day four or five. And then we went to this village uh, and this story is not particularly impressive, but it was just, it was the situation that was quite hairy. I mean, so these elephants had been raiding the villages at night and taking all the crops. So obviously the village people will, you know, bang pots and pans and throw coals and ambers and whatever off the fire at the elephants and firecrackers and all that kind of stuff. But <clears throat> there was, there was about six, they looked like roads, like dirt roads going into this thick chess bush. And uh, we estimated there must've been about two or 300 elephants in that patch of Jess. Um, and obviously they've been harassed by humans all, all night. Uh, so they go into this thick stuff because they know no one's coming in there. And, you know, we started going in there and there was just like it just erupted. There was just 
screams and branches breaking and there was turmoil and then we all looked at each other and we said oh, oh no we're not going <laughs> we're not going any further um yeah but yeah you you hear of those two three hundred elephants looking coming looking for people you know um yeah and there's there's loads of stories of people getting trampled and you know elephants smelling you and coming looking for you it's that whole same human wildlife conflict thing that's uh that's caused that yeah, I imagine. Was, so was that like a pro, was that a pack problem patrol hunt or was that just a regular tuskless hunt? No, it was a regular tuskless hunt, but uh, obviously because the, 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 the villagers were growing um, cotton and the elephants love those cotton seeds. Um, so, you know, every elephant in the whole vicinity is going to those uh, fields at night. So, you know, if you want to hunt a tuskless elephant, you've got to go there because they're all there. Yeah. Gotcha. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Huh, that's wild. Freak, dude, that leopard story. I'm just thinking. Well, I mean, no, you dude. obviously probably saw the Buffalo's video that went around on Instagram yesterday of the guy getting picked up by the Buffalo, obviously. <laughs> I'm just thinking. <laughs> yeah. I should have laughed, but yeah, it looked like he was yeah. riding the Buffalo. Yeah, no, it's hectic, dude. Um, uh, that's where okay. that guy almost shot, shot the freaking dude on the Exa Buffalo. Exactly. That's, that's the situation. You know, you... In those situations, you know, that bullet's going to kill you a hell of a lot quicker than, you know, the leopard or the buffalo or, I mean, elephant probably kill you quicker than the bullet, but, um, yeah. Yeah, crazy. it's freaking wild, but. Yeah, he was lucky yeah, not to get a charge. He was lucky not oh, to get a horn yeah. or something. Yeah, for sure. That is freaking wild. So, for this year, how many safaris you got planned so far? Oof. Yeah, I don't know. I think I've got, um, I don't know between eight and ten so quite a few um yeah but obviously I've, I've started doing a lot of more of these uh problem hyena hunts and uh problem animal control stuff um and i think it just makes for more entertaining viewing so i don't know i think in the future i might go a little bit more along that side for the for the tv show Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So, and then that would be just like with a local person, right? Like, um, yeah, you, you know, like a government, like a, yeah. Yeah. You can take gotcha. any professional hunter or I think you have to have a professional hunter because I'm not a licensed professional hunter in Zimbabwe. Um, so you have to have a professional hunter and, and then a national parks game scout as well. So as long as you've okay. got that, you're good to go. Um, obviously problem animal control is also in Zimbabwe. You cannot sell it. Um, you used to be able to sell it, but I think um, people are taking advantage, you know, and, and creating problem animal, <laughs> problem animal. Um, so, yeah, there's always that bit of skullduggery. Yeah, there's always a couple of bad eggs in every basket, I think. Exactly. And huh, the ones that's that sad. Them, yeah. yeah, 100%. Cool. Well, I know you got a lot of stuff to do, so let's we'll wrap this up. We'll do another one later, but how do people – find you on youtube how do people find you on instagram how do they get a hold of you so um youtube is this is africa forward slash this is africa five um and then youtube is at tia5 and i am on facebook as andy buchanan and um i forgot my facebook thing anyway i'm not very good at these technical <laughs> details but um yeah how do they find how do they find you buddy Oh, they'll find me. They're, yeah. they're listening. They'll find me. <laughs> no, nah, it's uh, for me. It's just uh, an Instagram. It's Mackenzie underscore underscore Sims, and then um, and I'm drawing a blank. Too. I think YouTube is just Mackenzie Sims, and then on Facebook it's just the same thing. Kind of keep it simple that way. So, but no, nah, man, I appreciate you hopping on. I know you guys are getting ready to head back to. Africa today, so I know you guys got some last minute Nashville shopping and tourism stuff to do. So I'll let you get to it, buddy, and I appreciate you hopping on. Awesome, buddy! Thanks for having me, and uh, yeah, I look forward to a long life of uh, hunting and conservation with folks like you. I appreciate it, Andy. Thanks, man. A lot to do. Cheers, something buddy. very soon. Chat you soon. Cheers. Bye now. Bye.